I need to say just a word about that new podcast. One of the books that we discussed was a book by someone that Dr. Sproul studied under for his doctoral studies at the Free University of Amsterdam, Garrett Cornelius Burkhauer. And as that episode began, I said to Dr. Sproul, now we Americans, we say Garrett Cornelius Burkhauer. How is it said in the Dutch? And Dr. Sproul says, Garrett. And I say, Garrett? 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 And this goes back and forth for about the first two minutes. So you do not want to miss this new podcast. It's very exciting material and will edify your soul. <laughs> Let me just uh, say uh, my uh, word here to what has been said uh, multiple times. Uh, this is truly a bitter, sweet conference uh, for us. It is always a sweet moment. And uh, it's been my true delight to get to know many of you over these past several years. And so I always look forward to these times of getting to greet you in the halls and catch up with what's going on in your lives, and also to just be surrounded by folks who love God's Word and love the Reformed tradition and just want to be taught. We so enjoy you, and we so enjoy being with you. These are sweet moments for us at Ligonier, but this is indeed a bittersweet year for us. Uh, we miss them, and I know you do too. And uh, so, uh, as we think about this, this topic of awakening, uh, you know, it was Dr. Sproul that uh, gave us this topic. It was a few years ago when we were on the New England study tour and uh, re retracing the steps of Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield and thinking about this, this vital topic of awakening. And so it's a bittersweet moment for us. Well, we are in the book of Isaiah. We are in Isaiah chapter 55 verses 10 to 11. Isaiah chapter 55 is one grand and glorious invitation. The first word of this chapter is, come. We'll pick it up at verse 10. Isaiah 55, verses 10 and 11. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower, bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, today we have been encouraged, we've been challenged, we've been comforted, and once again we pause and return to Your Word and look to Your Word. May You help us as we look into it. May it be a true mirror into our souls. And in this Word, may we see the image of Your dear Son, and may we be transformed to that image. Help us, we pray. Amen. I was in California two times this year, and both times it rained the entire time I was there. And the ironic thing about that is both times everyone there in California told me the same thing. It never rains in California. I was in San Diego as Dr. Godfrey was handing on the baton to the next president there at Westminster Seminary, California, and it started raining. As soon as I got there, it was raining, and it rained all day long, and it rained all night long, and everybody I ran into told me it never rains in California. And we were out in L.A. just briefly. We had this event at UCLA with Dr. Moeller and an apologetic seminar on the campus of UCLA, and it rained all day long. It started raining at 9 a.m., and it didn't stop till 5.30 p.m., and everyone I bumped into said, it never rains here in California. Now, I've read R.C. Sproul's Defending Your Faith, and I believe in the basic reliability of sense perception, and I believe in the law of non-contradiction. And so I simply went outside, put my hand out, it got wet, and I said, guess what? It's raining in California. <laughs> now, you could be disappointed to travel all the way to California 
and have nonstop rain. But I knew how important that was to those people. And so I did not regret for a moment that it was raining in California. I was happy for them that they were getting this much needed rain. We spent many years in Lancaster County living among the Amish. Uh, they could grow crops out of the middle of the road. They're so good at it. And many of those years we were there were drought years. And I remember summer after summer, August would roll around and these poor little corn stalks would look so dilapidated and yellowing and browning and cracking and falling over. And then all of a sudden, that mid-August, late-August rain would come. And the corn stalks would just come to life. They would shoot up and they would get all verdant and they would be abundant with corn. And the Amish farmers would breathe a sigh of relief and a smile would come on their face. We who do not farm miss verses like Isaiah chapter 55, verse 10. It's an illustration. It's a metaphor. And this illustration would have meant the world to Isaiah's audience. They would have understood it palpably as it was put before them. You know, there's a key phrase in here that I think Isaiah is very intentional in using. We have this word direct from God through the prophet Isaiah, for as the rain and snow come down, and here's the key, from heaven. From heaven. It's interesting being around farmers. It's not so true today because of all of our irrigation techniques. But it's interesting being around old school farmers because they understand what they can do and what they cannot do. They understand a concept of dependence. They know that they can cultivate the soil. They know that they can sow the seed and plant the crop, but they know they are dependent on a source outside of themselves to make all the difference for that crop. And they know where those rains come from. They don't come from atmospheric pressures. They come from heaven. As God, in His goodness, sends the rains and the snows, and they come down from heaven, and there is a wonderful relationship here in verse 10 of cause and effect, that this proper cause of rain brings back, or brings about rather, this effect of seeds germinating and growing and producing a crop. And without the rains, there would be no crops, and the would-be eater would have nothing to eat and would die. And an agrarian culture. Rain was the difference between life and death. But when the rains came and the crops came, the eater would have food and the eater would be alive. All of that is packed into verse 10. It is the illustration. It is proving a point. It is proving a point from nature. It is proving a point from logic of the law of cause and effect. And it is proving a point that there is an external force that makes the difference and brings about the ultimate desired result. The other thing lingering in verse 10 is there is a promise, and that promise entails life. The rains aren't just water, they're life. And then we come to verse 11. So the key is verse 11. The point is verse 11. We're told very clearly, so shall my word be. Exactly as verse 10 has it with this natural illustration, so now as we transition and pivot, it will be exactly the same with what Isaiah wants to tell us about the Word of God. This word that goes out from my mouth, it shall not return to me empty. We see here cause 
in effect, and we also see in here a promise. The cause is very simple. It's the Word of God. And as the Word of God goes out, not sometimes, not most of the time, but every single time, it succeeds. Every single time, it produces the effect. It is a truly proper cause, a truly proper cause that will truly bring about the intended effect. Now, the key here is understanding that it is the success according to God's design. Notice what it says in verse 11, it shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which it, which I rather, purpose. If we go up to verses 8 and 9, we get a little more insight to this, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. It's not that God's Word accomplishes what we think it should accomplish. It's not that God's Word accomplishes the purposes that we want it to accomplish. It accomplishes the purposes that God has intended for it. And we are reminded that His ways are so far above our ways, that His ways are superior to our ways. But it will always be successful. It will always succeed. It will always succeed. So what exactly are we talking about here in God's Word? I was thinking of just a few verses that were in Isaiah itself surrounding this chapter. You know, Isaiah chapter 40 to 66 is called the book of comfort because of how chapter 40 begins, comfort, O oh, comfort, my people. And so, I just found a few, four promises from Isaiah 40 to 50, uh, up to 55 here where we're reading. In chapter 40, verse 29, God promises to give strength to the weary. His Word declare, declares that He will give strength to the weary. And He will always accomplish His purpose. It's a promise of God that He will strengthen the weary. In Isaiah 41.10, He says, Do not be afraid. I will strengthen you. I will help you. God promises, His Word promises to assist us, to come to our aid to help us. And He will always do that. He will always do that. Isaiah chapter 43 verse 2 says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Metaphor again, for those difficult, turbulent, tumultuous times where you feel as if you're drowning and you can't even feel the ground beneath you and you're caught up. God is with us. It's His Word. He has promised it. It will happen. In chapter 54, verse 17, He says, no weapon forged against you will prevail. My, I don't know if I should tell you this story or not. My wife's cringing already because she knows I'm doing this, and she's thinking, don't do this. My wife and I went out for dinner, we came back home, and our 15-year-old son had created a forge in our backyard and was forging his own weapons. I was rather proud of him <laughs> for display, of course. <clears throat> I am going to pay for that <laughs> later. <laughs> but, but no weapon forged against you. Now, we're not talking about the B team or the junior varsity team. We're talking about Babylon. We're talking about Assyria. We're talking about people like Nebuchadnezzar. We're talking about Cyrus, 
Cyrus, one of the greatest warlords to ever come onto the pages of history. And no weapon forged by the Assyrians, by the Babylonians, by the Egyptians. No weapon forged against you will prevail. These are some of the promises. You know, one of the things we learn from Isaiah chapter 55 verse 11 is this. When we doubt God's Word, we are doubting God Himself. When we doubt His Word, we are doubting God Himself. Because His Word is astoundingly powerful because it is His Word. Behind the Word of God is God, and this is the transcendent being. This is the holy being. This is the being, as Aristotle called Him, the pure act. In one of these books, in this open book podcast, it was Turretin's Institutes of Elenctic Theology, and I'm sitting there and I'm flipping through the margins and I see this Latin expression that R.C. had written across the top, ens perfectissimus, the most perfect being. If we were to actually translate that literally, you know what we would say? The mostest, perfectest being. It's the highest, perfect is a superlative to begin with. And then to say God is perfectissimus is a superlative on top of a superlative. This is the God behind His Word, and that's why God's Word is astoundingly powerful. And when we doubt God's Word, we are doubting God. We're doubting God Himself. Flip it around. When we trust in God's Word, we are trusting in God himself. There are many promises in Scripture, but this conference is on the topic of awakening. And so, fundamentally, we are all brought back to the singular promise, aren't we, that God's Word promises to bring life where there is death. God's Word promises resurrection. It promises spiritual resurrection in that the day, the second, the nanosecond that Adam partook of the forbidden fruit, he died. He died spiritually. He died in that he was cut off from God, and he began the process of death physically. And all these promises of God throughout all of His Word come down to the promise of resurrection that we are raised in newness of life at the nanosecond that we become Christ's and put our faith in Him, and that someday our physical death will be reversed and we will be given a new and glorified body. And why stop there? Let's transform the whole thing, and we'll have a new heavens and a new earth. And that is the promise of God. That is the promise of awakening, and there is only one means that that awakening comes about, and it only comes about through His Word, because His Word is the only thing that is promised to succeed. As reflecting on what Luther said, I have a Luther quote right here. I try never to leave home without a Luther quote in my pocket, as do you. Luther says on Isaiah 55, 11, this paragraph is spoken in part for the confutation of the stubborn and also in part for the consolation of the weak. For consolation because the word seems so weak and foolish that there appears to be no strength in it. How can it be believed? How can it be believed that all the power, victory, and triumph of God are in the word of a feeble human mouth of the prophet. And so, God comes to meet this scandal of the weak, 
and this scandal of the stubborn. For all the enemies say, do you really think that everything depends on the Word? Now listen, if this was true in the 16th century, is not this true in the 21st century? Do we not even have those who claim to be Christians who would say something like this? Do you really think that everything depends on the Word? Must we not come to its aid? Must we not pay attention to technique? Must we not figure out a better way, a better mousetrap to sell the gospel? The enemies say, do you really think that everything depends on a word? We must act. We must work. We must think. That's what the enemy say. There's a time in American history where this trajectory of revivals sort of went off track a little bit. If we go back to the first Great Awakening, prior to that we have a minor Great Awakening. It's called the Connecticut River Valley Revivals. These were from 1734 to 1736. They were a bit of a foreshadowing of the Great Awakening to come in 1740 to 1742. Connecticut River Valley, of course, was that center of population in the New England colonies. You had the eastern seaboard and the coast, but then you had the Connecticut River Valley cutting all the way through Massachusetts down into Connecticut and then branching over to the Atlantic Ocean. And right there in the middle of Massachusetts, in the very middle of the state, east, west, north, south, right in the middle is a little town of Northampton, right on the Connecticut River Valley. And there in that church and that pulpit, Jonathan Edwards was preaching sermons with abandon. In 1731, he preached his sermon, God glorified in man's dependence. And in 1734, he preached a sermon entitled, A Divine and Supernatural Light. If we are to be awakened, Edwards preached to his congregation, if we are to be brought out of death and into life, if we are to be made new, it's a divine and supernatural light. We preach the Word, and God will do everything else. We faithfully preach the Word, and God will accomplish His purposes of bringing about a holy nation and His church. And Edwards believed that, and that's how he preached, and out of that came revivals. Edwards wrote a book about his first book, a narrative, a faithful narrative of the surprising work of God. He wrote it up as a story for the Boston paper. And the Boston paper sent it across the sea, and it landed into the hands of a young hymn writer named Isaac Watts, and he thought this was great. And he said, tell this guy, Jonathan Edwards, whoever he is, that if he expands on this, we'll publish it as a book. And Edwards did, and it's Edwards' first book, published by Isaac Watts in England, a faithful narrative of the surprising work of God. But it started in the pulpit at Northampton, and Edwards simply believing in the power of the Word of God. And that revival in 1734 to 35 led to the Great Awakening. Up and down the colonies and across the sea in England, awakening. But somewhere along the line in the course of American history, the idea seeped in that we can do more than simply pray down a revival. We can also work it up. And somewhere there in the 18th century, we began to introduce the idea of techniques. And we began to see some, something that we could do to affect revival. And we began to taint this biblical concept of revival this biblical idea of awakening. And we need to purge the concept of revival and awakening from that. We must hear what Luther says. Do you really think that everything depends on the Word? Oh, yes, we do. Oh, yes, we do. Luther says, here the text confounds their thoughts. If you think it's your work and your action, you're wrong. Luther goes on to say, God does not say 
to you, your works and your thoughts do this, but God says, my word. It is therefore a consolation. Isaiah 55, 11 is a consolation for lifting up the weak, and it is a confutation, lest anyone be offended by the lowliness of God and the lowliness of His Word. Luther concludes by saying, so our building and promotion of the church is not the result of our works, but of the Word of God which we preach. Here, here you see that everything, everything is produced by the Word. It's Luther on Isaiah 55, 11. Usually Calvin's not known for his brevity. But he takes what Luther said in a paragraph and he boils it down to seven words. We must therefore come to the Word. If there is to be an awakening on any level, individual, local, national, global, on any level, a genuine awakening will always be as a result of the Word of God. And the lesson in that is exactly what Calvin says, we must come to the Word, and we must come to the Word again, and we must come to the Word again, and we must come to the Word again, and we must always and everywhere and at all times come to the Word. That's what Isaiah is trying to tell us here, that there is new life, that there is awakening, that there are these promises of God, and we must come to the Word. Why must we come to the Word? Well, we must come to the Word because, as verse 9 tells us, there is an infinite distance between us and God. There's an infinite distance between us and God. In, in Isaiah's time, the audience was somewhat limited in their understanding of the cosmos. They didn't have telescopes. They didn't have spacecraft launched from Cape Canaveral and sending back images of outer space. If, if in Isaiah's audience we'd have that, we would say, God's thoughts are so far superior than anything that Hubble has been able to show us of the grandeur and majesty of the galaxies. But what Isaiah had and what his audience had was simply the heavens and the earth. And in that day, that was an absolute infin infinite distance. And so, to say that God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts, we need to see how, to what degree are they higher. They are as high as the heavens are to earth, and that is to say they are at an infinite distance, and that is to say that we are at an infin infinite distance from God. And let's no, make no mistake about this, it's not simply epistemological difference. That is, when it comes to the idea of truth and knowledge, it's not just that our rational skills are lesser than God's, and therefore His thoughts are more than our thoughts. It's also ethical. It's also that He… How many times have we been taught this by Dr. Sproul? God is holy, and we are not. God is holy, and we are not. And as there is an infinite epistemological distance between us and God, there is an infinite ethical and moral distance between us and God. And no natural means will overcome that distance. Do you know why in this revivalism culture we can introduce the idea of our works as contributing to bring about the desired ends, it's because we're not giving the gospel message. We're not talking about God and His holiness. We're not talking about man and his utter sinfulness. We're not talking about the exclusivity of Christ and the utter necessity of His death on the cross. 
the moment we start smuggling us into the equation, we dilute every one of those theological themes. We lasso, as it were, God, and we bring Him down a little bit, and we neglect His holiness. And we have far too high view of ourselves, and we neglect our utter depravity. And oh, to our shame, we diminish the cross of Christ. When we begin to understand that there is an infinite distance between us and God, we are on our knees begging for God to give us His Word. And when He gives us His, His Word, there is life where there was death, and there is hope where there was hopelessness. And look at verse 12, for you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. There's joy where there was anger and bitterness, and there was peace where there was a relentless conflict. And only the Word of God can do that. Only the Word of God can do that because of the infinite distance and here's the beauty of what this text is telling us. God's Word spans the infinite distance. Now, in Isaiah's day, the issue, the direct issue, the immediate issue was how is God going to return Israel from captivity in Babylon and then Medo-Persia? You know, prof Isaiah is a prophecy. It is an eleventh-hour prophecy to Israel to repent. It is a prophecy full of judgment for Israel for breaking covenant, but it is also a prophecy that looks not only to the judgment and the exile, but it's a prophecy that looks past the exile and sees the initial restoration and even looks past that restoration and sees the ultimate restoration. All that is bound up in the prophet Isaiah, writing as he is on the eve of the captivity by Babylon. And that is a tall order. How does Medo-Persia one day, all of a sudden, how does Cyrus all of a sudden one day decide, I'm going to let Israel go back? And by the way, how do you move a nation across a desert? Now we know why Isaiah chapter 40 talks about making a straight path and leveling mountains and raising valleys so that we have a straight path. And now we know Isaiah 40 talks about bringing strength that even the young men will faint. And so we will walk and not grow weary. We'll run and we'll soar like eagles because it's a monumental task to bring a nation out of captivity and bring them back into the land. And that promise is fulfilled. It's exactly what God accomplishes. His Word is astoundingly powerful. But Isaiah also helps us look past because not only was that an unthinkable chasm to cross from, from Babylon and Medo-Persia to Israel, a seemingly infinite distance to move a whole nation across that desert, but it pales in comparison to moving sinners to being friends. It pales in comparison to taking we who are clothed in filthy rags and bringing us into the presence of God dressed in righteous robes. And as God's Word was powerful enough to span the chasm of the desert to bring Israel back into the land, and as God's Word was powerful enough to bring out of the rubble of a fallen city walls and out of the rubble of a fallen city another temple and out of a fallen and exiled people a nation, it's nothing, it's nothing compared to the miracle of bringing sinners to salvation. 
This is the power of God's Word. And because this is the power of God's Word, we must always proclaim God's Word because it always accomplishes God's purposes. We must always proclaim God's Word because it always accomplishes God's purposes. This past summer, we had the opportunity to travel the lands of Luther, and one place that impressed me deeply was a town that I had read about many times, and I had read about Luther's presence there. It's the town of Torgau, but being there was all the difference in the world. And it was in this town, the significance of this town is that in this town was built the first Protestant church. Now, many of the churches were Catholic and just simply converted over to Protestant churches. Luther's church at Wittenberg, St. Mary's church was a Catholic church for centuries, and it just became a Protestant church. The castle church, the Schlosskirche, with the famous doors, the most famous doors in the world, right? It was Catholic. But here at Torgau, the prince wanted a new church. Princes get what princes want. And so the prince got a new church. And in 1544, they dedicated the first Protestant church. And who are you going to have dedicate the first Protestant church but the guy who started the whole thing in the first place? So along comes Luther, and he preaches the dedicatory sermon at the church at Torgau. He says many things in there about the power of God's Word, but he boils it all down to one sentence. We can spare everything except the Word. Now, this is a hard lesson for the American church to learn. It's a hard lesson for the global church to learn because very sadly, much of the global church has followed our lead. That God's Word is not enough. It won't hold their interest. It won't bring them in. It won't connect with their life. And here is my favorite. It's no longer relevant. It's not cutting edge. For the last three decades of my life, I've wanted to write a book, Razor Burns from the Cutting Edge. <laughs> we think we must come to the assistance of God's Word. Shame on us. Shame on us. And let's hear the words of Luther. We can let all those things go that we think bring them in. We can let all those techniques go that we think are important. We can spare everything. As I like to joke, we can even spare Tuesday night aerobics in the church basement. But we cannot spare the Word. It is the Word of God that is powerful. It is the Word of God that spans this absolute distance. But I loved Luther's quote because Luther's quote said two things. It confutes the enemies of God's Word. And listen, those enemies aren't always outside of the church. It confutes the enemies, but it also consoles the weak. You know, one of those beautiful doctrines of Scripture, the attributes of Scripture, and we talk about the authority of Scripture. We talk about the perspicuity of Scripture, and I love the perspicuity of Scripture because perspicuity is a very unclear word that means clear. <laughs> you know theologians do this because they could just simply call it the clarity of the word. No. <laughs> Let's call it the perspicuity of the word because we're theologians and that's what we do. But I also love the sufficiency of Scripture. And here's where the rubber meets the road, doesn't it? So we say, yes, we believe in the power of God. But, you know, in this one tiny thing right here, maybe the Word of God is not sufficient. We say, we affirm, I don't think any of us would not agree with Isaiah 55, 11. If I were to take a poll, I think we'd get 
Yes. But what about in this little thing right here? You know, every time I listen to Johnny Erickson Tata, I feel like a pygmy. I truly do. You do too. We're just standing in the presence of an unbelievable person. And to hear her talk about her trust in God's Word and to hear her re replay rebuking herself, how, how many areas do we doubt the power, the efficacy of God's Word? Because Luther's right, we are weak. We are weak. And weak people do desperate things. And we try to take things into our own hands, and we actually think, here in the 21st century, we know better than God's Word. We'd never say that. We would never say that. But sometimes it's true of how we think. And so here comes Pastor Luther, and he tells us, you who are weak, be consoled. It really is powerful enough. You may face this particular thing, and it seems absolutely intractable. There is no way out. And we have to trust in the power of the Word of God. And we have to say, His Word will accomplish its purpose, and if God has promised it, it will come to pass. It's not just thinking about it in terms of the higher plane of the trajectory of the church and when the wheels fall off the wagon and when we get it right. We also have to think about it in our existential experiences, those moments of our lives when in practice we doubt the power of God's Word and we doubt its efficacy. And so, what is Isaiah 55 but an invitation, invitation, a summons? Come, the prophet tells us. You're thirsty. You don't even know you're thirsty, <laughs> but trust me, you're thirsty. And you go here and there. Remember Jesus? He's, he's wandering through Samaria. He comes across this woman of a questionable reputation, and He teaches her a lesson, doesn't He? If you knew who I was, if you knew who I was, you would ask of me, and I would give you a drink. And let's say you don't have any money to buy water and milk. Isn't this a great series of beverages? Back in chapter 55, verse 1, come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. You have no money. You have nothing. Come, buy, and eat. Come buy wine and… I didn't know these three go together, wine and milk and water. but they do. And why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? How true is this? I mean, how true is this culturally? Uh, of this, this is what we do, isn't it? This is what Americans do. We just buy stuff. We, we buy our way into our fulfillment. We buy our way into meaning. We buy our way into happiness. We buy our way. And whatever think we need that we would consider salvation, we just buy it. And what a beautiful invitation this is. Why do you waste your money? Why do you think you can find what you need? And you labor, you work, you toil, you're white-knuckling it, you've got sweat on your brow. 
and you're getting food that does not satisfy. These are just ordinary things, wine and milk and water and bread. And God is using them to say, this is the essence of His goodness for us. And come to me. Come to me. It's here. It's everything you need. Listen diligently to me. Now, we're switching metaphors here. Editors don't like it. When I, when, sometimes I'll, I'll switch metator, metaphors in a sentence, and these editors with their red pens, and they say, oh, you've, you've switched the metaphor here. They change it back. But this is exactly what the prophet says. This is God now switching the metaphor. And you know why he says, listen? You know why he says, listen? Because it's all a metaphor for his word. That's why. Listen. Why should we listen? Because it's God's Word that we must listen to. And so, what does He say? Listen. And when you listen, you will eat that which is good. That's a mixed metaphor. You should say you hear that which is good. But it's nourishment. It's like food. It's the difference between life and death. And not only is it nourishing and life-giving, but it's good and it is enjoyable. And it's not just bread. It's rich food. What a glorious invitation. What a glorious invitation. And so, this invitation comes to us. It comes to us because we need it. It doesn't come to us as a luxury. It doesn't come to us as an alternative. It comes to us as a necessity. And it's a necessity because of our state. And so this invitation comes. And the whole, the whole chapter is full of God's goodness, isn't it? The whole chapter is just overflowing with God's goodness to us. And a reminder that He is a promise-keeping, covenant, faithful God who loves His people and will lavish riches upon His people. And I know you, you know, this is not prosperity gospel. Do we, we don't even have to say that, do we? But lavish riches upon us, and it all flows from His Word. This is holy ground. This is a banquet table. This is a king's feast. And what happens? I already read the first few verses, words rather, of verse 12. But what happens when God's Word is preached? You should go out in joy. You should be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth into singing. All the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. I hate thorns. I hate thorns. We have these palm trees down here that we have to trim, these pygmy palms, and they have these four-inch lethal thorns that literally jump off the palm and embed themselves in your body that you have to watch out for. I would take a cypress tree over a thorn any day. Instead of the briar shall come up myrtle, and it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. But do you know what's not here in Isaiah chapter 55? What we read in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 2. In past times, the author of Hebrew remind, Hebrews reminds us these prophets spoke in many ways and in diverse manners. Prophets like Isaiah, who told us that God's Word alone is the source of all of our success, that God's Word is powerful. It is astoundingly powerful. Just preach it and get out of the way. But in these last days, 
God has spoken to us in His Son. The tupas, the type, the perfect, the logos, the perfect Word of God. And if there is ever an awakening in our lives, in our churches, in our nation, it will be, it will be because we proclaim the Word, that Word that is above all earthly powers, and in that Word is life, everlasting life, and we go forth in joy and in peace. Amen.